<clears throat> well, as I mentioned uh, last week, Jerry provided us with a, an excellent uh, introductory first lesson that gave us some context, uh, talked about some of those um, congregations of the Lord's Church that were established during his first missionary journey in the region of Galatia um, and gave us some context and background about um, um, what was going on at the time as the um, new um, kingdom uh, of, of God was trying its best to establish itself um, uh, probably somewhere in the neighborhood of the first uh, quarter of a century um, uh, following its establishment uh, on the day of Pentecost um, in Jerusalem. And uh, uh, today we're going to actually just specifically look at the introductory um, words of this letter, um, verses 1 through 5 specifically of chapter 1 there in Galatians. Of course, in each of Paul's um, letters that he wrote under the inspiration of the Holy Spirit to, what, to whatever congregation of the Lord's church or to whatever individual he might be writing to, he always had some form of an introductory paragraph, which, of course, was not only uh, um, standard and usual practice in that day and time in the first century, but um, uh, for those of us that can remember written letters, it's still a stand with some type of salutation and introductory material. Now, letters have be are uh, rapidly becoming um, kind of a thing of the past, I guess. I can't remember the last time I actually received a written letter from someone. Now, I've received cards and notes and what not, but an actual letter, I just don't remember. Uh, I, I, I mean a friendly one uh, or a, a handwritten one. I've, I've received uh, other letters uh, that I can recall, but th those we won't uh, dwell on today. Let's, let's get into this looking first at, at, at the author of this letter. Uh, and of course, a reminder, as we always need to remind uh, ourselves and, and certainly Others, the author truly is God. Uh, all scripture is God breathed. And so the author is actually God through the Holy Spirit. Uh, he inspired Paul using Paul's talents and Paul's intellect and Paul's style of writing, but God used him to uh, write this letter. The writer was Paul. Uh, formerly, we knew him, of course, as Saul of Tarsus. Um, who had been quite a severe persecutor of the church. He was an apostle. Uh, in it uh, parenthetically says, not sent from men, uh, nor through the agency of man, but through Jesus Christ and God the Father who raised him from the dead. Um, now to compare this to some other introductions in other letters by Paul, uh, Paul uh, calls himself or labels himself a servant, uh, called to be an apostle. And by the way, apostle, as probably most of you know, um, has a meaning, whether it's a um, uh, religious, in, in a religious context or, or otherwise, it is a, an ambassador uh, that has some type of official capacity. And uh, that's what an apostle is. He also has called himself on occasion an apostle by the will of God, an apostle by the command of God, a prisoner uh, of God or a prisoner of Christ, and sometimes he just calls himself Paul. But Galatians, interestingly enough, is the only uh, of his letters, the only one of his letters, uh, where he makes uh, this full statement that he does uh, about being apostle, not sent from men, but sent... Um, uh, through uh, Christ Jesus and the will of God who raised Jesus from the dead. And it's important for Paul to do that uh, at the outset of this letter because as we will study uh, over the course of this quarter, uh, 
he, he wants to make sure he establishes the divine source of the message that he's going to give uh, through the inspiration of the Holy Spirit. And he'll develop this thought uh, more fully later on, uh, starting in verse 11 of this first chapter and going to about the middle of um, chapter 2. Galatians is Paul's only letter with no praise for its readers, uh, though there's an, uh, an implied hope for correction uh, based on their kind treatment when he needed it, and that's uh, touched upon in uh, chapter 4. But it is significant, and it's fairly, it kind of jumps out at you after you've read enough of Paul's letters, uh, particularly the introductory material, that, to see that uh, there was not the, the praise for those that he's writing to uh, that there are in some of his other, other letters. Uh, and Paul's apostleship is going to, of course, be his authority to deal with uh, false teaching. Um, and, and that's why there was not the uh, uh, perhaps usual praise in the introduction of his letter, because this was a stern letter. This was a letter that he wanted to get right to the crux of the matter, why he was writing the letter. Uh, he, was, he was concerned about uh, uh, the impact and influence that uh, uh, some people were having uh, on the truth in their effort to subvert the truth and, and the um, impact that was having and the resulting problems that that was creating amongst uh, people of the church. He then references uh, all the brethren uh, who are with me. Paul uh, almost always had traveling companions. He often included some of them in the salutations of his letter, uh, by name even. Uh, preaching the gospel is always done, of course, in uh, fellowship uh, with others. Uh, the church, of course, uh, itself uh, being a fellowship. Uh, that tells us something about the, the author as we look at the very uh, first uh, uh, few lines of uh, the introduction. Uh, and then we see the recipients of this letter, the readers at this time, the recipients of this letter at this time, uh, to the churches of Galatia, which of course Jerry did such a great job last week of providing us some information and context uh, about them. Um, all of Paul's other letters are addressed either to a specific church or to a specific person. This is the only one of his letters that uh, is more general in that it's to the churches of an area uh, that was intended to be circulated. Um, this is Paul's only general letter. Um, others were circular in that they were passed um, from one church to another, but this, this one specifically, he intended uh, that to be the case. Uh, the churches that we're talking about in this region of Galatia, as I mentioned, were, were discussed last week. Um, Acts chapters 13 and 14 provide a background for these churches uh, for your, uh, your reading on your time. Of course, Antioch of Pisidia, Iconium, Lystra, and Derby. Uh, the date of the writing of this particular letter is uh, unknown, and there are uh, different uh, opinions among Bible scholars and, and uh, people that uh, study religious writings. Uh, there are differences of opinion of when it was written. Um, and so we, we really can't know for certain. It is probably, surely, probably one of Paul's earliest letters because these churches were established, as we mentioned, on his first missionary journey, uh, which would have been in the late uh, 40s uh, AD. The purpose uh, of this letter, of course, is to correct false teaching about the demand for Christians to keep the law. That is specifically the reason this was written, specifically to those churches in Galatia that were experiencing a lot of problems uh, caused by people who said you needed to continue to keep the old law, notwithstanding your, your uh, uh, 
condition or position vis-a-vis -vis Christ now, you still needed to keep the tenets of the old law. Uh, so uh, that was having a, a detrimental influence, of course, because that was not the intent. Scripture tells us that we are now under a new covenant, a new uh, will and testament, if you will, of Jesus Christ. And so uh, Paul was trying to make that case. Now that is what specifically prompted the writing of this letter under the inspiration of the Holy Spirit to those particular people. But of course, because it's in the canon of the New Testament, it is for all time. It is for us as well. We'll talk about the application for us uh, at the uh, end of today's lesson. But it was written specifically to the churches in Galatia and specifically to correct the false teaching um, uh, that were, uh, was being circulated uh, as demanding Christians to continue to keep the law of Moses. The theme of, of this is, of course, the purpose would be done by keeping Christ in his rightful place. Christ appears, the men name, mention of Christ appears 38 times in Galatians. Uh, Christ is at the center of every argument. Uh, in this particular letter. And of course, um, Christ is at the center of the entire Holy Bible. Scripture is centered on Jesus Christ. He is the pivotal and principal uh, figure in our faith. Uh, grace to you and peace from God our Father and the Lord Jesus Christ. Um, grace. Um, of course, we know uh, grace uh, needs a careful biblical definition. The Greek word for grace, the root, is charis, C-H-A-R-I-S, and you may hear in that the word charity, uh, but the Greek word for grace is charis, uh, unmerited favor. Uh, this is the first of seven times grace appears in Galatians. Uh, here and in uh, chapter 6, verse 18, it's a blessing or a prayer. Uh, later on in chapter 1, uh, verse 15, and the second chapter in verse 9, Paul applies it to himself, to what he has received from God, that is the grace he's received from God. Um, Again, in chapter 1, verses 6 and 7, it's linked to the very gospel or good news of Christ. In chapter 2 and in, again in chapter 5, it's the means of salvation as contrasted with the law. In fact, our study this quarter in looking at the book of Galatians is entitled Salvation by Grace. That focuses, of course, on God's part in salvation, the preeminent part, I might add, in salvation. We can do nothing ourselves to earn salvation. It has to be provided as a gift from God, which uh, he so gracefully did. Uh, other titles that might be given uh, to the letter of Galatians, salvation by active faith, Faith appears 22 times in Galatians and is connected with justification. Uh, we should emphasize an obedient faith, a faith working through love, as it says in uh, chapter 5, verse 6, to distinguish from the idea of faith only. Defense of the gospel of Christ. The definition, uh, dictionary definition of grace is in Christian belief, the free and unmerited favor of God. That should not be used to conclude that man can do nothing to affect his own salvation. Again, the, um, the image we've used a lot, it's an image I first heard many, many, many years ago and I've always liked it. It is the image of the man drowning and the image of a life preserver. Um, the life preserver is the gift, but we have to take advantage of that gift. We have to put the life preserver on or we will still drown. Uh, so first comes the life preserver and then comes our crawling into the life preserver, putting it on. And uh, that's what I think uh, 
Our faith is all about the fact that God provides us salvation by His grace if we take advantage of that grace through an obedient faith. Titus 2, this is on the back page of your outline. We're now there. Titus 2, 11 through 12 teaches that God's grace demands specific actions from men. For the grace of God has appeared, bringing salvation to all men, instructing us to deny ungodliness and worldly desires and to live sensibly, righteously, and godly in the present age. And Galatians itself has several demands for faithful obedience. So we will see both. We will see uh, God's grace and man's reaction to that grace. Peace is mentioned. Peace would come when false doctrine was corrected and the church focused on Christ. That's the peace that is uh, mentioned here in this introductory, uh, these introductory uh, phrases. Who gave himself for our sins so that he might rescue us from the present evil age according to the will of our God and Father to whom be the glory forevermore. This is the basic fact. This, prince, this present evil age has attacked the churches through false teachers. That was then. That's now. That's why the Bible never gets old. It doesn't age. Circumstances may change in terms of what, what we're looking at. We'll talk about that at the tail end of our lessons. But again... The present evil age was then, as this was being written, inspired by the Holy Spirit, but the present evil age continues to exist. I am amazed that you are so quickly deserting him who called you by the grace of Christ for a different gospel, which is really not another, only there are some who are disturbing you and want to distort the gospel of Christ. That comes from... Uh, the first two verses of what we're going to be looking at next week, chapter 1, 6, and 7. Who has bewitched you? That's uh, a phrase from the third chapter of Galatians, 3, verse 1. There are at least four ways that Jews responded to, the Christ, uh, to Christ and the gospel. Uh, some were open in their opposition to Christ in the church. That's one way. Paul himself, uh, as Saul... Uh, before the road to Damascus is a great example. Um, as he says, I used to persecute the church of God beyond measure and tried to destroy it. And so there were those Jews that were just openly hostile and in opposition. Jews followed Paul throughout this area of Galatia and caused trouble. Uh, there's a quote in here that says, but when the Jews saw the crowds, they were filled with jealousy and began, and there is a typo there. My apologies to happen to point that out, but there is a couple of words left out. Began to contradict or to oppose the things spoken by Paul. And uh, you can see those references to the opposition that uh, some of the Jews had and some of the problems they tried to stir up in Acts 13 uh, as well as Acts 14. <clears throat> some accepted Christ. That's a second uh, reaction. Uh, some accepted Christ but taught that the law was still binding. They were called Judaizers. These were the false teachers viewed in Galatians. They were the ones that were really kind of causing the problems because instead of opposing this new faith, the true faith. They accepted it on the one hand, but tried to adulterate it on the other by saying you still had to hold on to the old law. So it was uh, an acceptance cafeteria style, how they wanted to accept it. And it's something, of course, that has plagued the church from this very early time, and it's something that plagues the church, of course, today which we'll touch on here in a moment. And I might say, regrettably, it will always plague the Lord's church because uh, man can't leave perfection alone. And <clears throat> regrettably, we don't do a good job of taking what God has given us and accepting it and leaving it alone. We think we have to always... Uh, 
improve it. It was very difficult for Jews to accept Gentiles. Um, the Apostle Peter is a good example of this, uh, and we read about it in Acts 10 and 11, and then we're going to have uh, a reference to it in this letter uh, when we look at chapter 2. Um, so that's two ways. Some just were outright opposed, did all they could to destroy the church before it even got started. Some accepted Christ, but said the law was still binding. Some were confused, not able to refute false teachings. These were the ones Paul wanted to reach and to teach. Some people are throwing you into confusion and are trying to pervert the gospel of Christ. Uh, that from uh, verse 7, a little later on here in chapter 1. Finally, there was the group that accepted and enjoyed the freedom they had found in Christ. And of course, Paul and many other converts are examples of this. Um, and a couple of um, citations that Jerry mentions there are Acts 13.43 and Acts 17.4. Because Jesus gave himself for our sins so that he might rescue us according to the will of our God and Father, Christians can overcome this evil age, this present evil age. And of course, that applies in this writing, specifically to the Christians in that region of Galatia. And, of course, more broadly, it applies to Christians of each and every present evil age, right up into, to include uh, 20,021. 2021. <clears throat> By continuing in the gospel of Christ, that's how you can overcome. By sticking to what God wants, what makes God happy, what God intended. By rejecting false doctrines that brought bondage of the old law and canceled the liberty or the freedom found in Christ. And that we will look at when we get to chapter 2. By standing firm and not subject to the yoke of slavery, which we'll look at in chapter 5. By avoiding being severed from Christ and to have fallen from grace, which we'll study also in chapter 5, which, of course, is a concept that's biblical. That is to say, we can fall from God's grace. Um, there are those who have decided to put their own spin on God's truth that argue that we can't fall from grace the once saved, always saved philosophy. And while, wistfully, I wish that were the case, uh, regrettably, that's not what uh, God's Word teaches. Uh, we can, if we're not uh, diligent, we can fall from grace. The basic purpose of Galatians was to rescue the readers from this present evil age that is more specifically defined in the rest of the letter as the Jewish teachings, that is, the teachings of the Judaizers, those that said, yes, you can accept Christ, but you also have to continue uh, to accept and adhere to certain tenets of the old law. Um, you can see how that would uh, create a lot of confusion uh, in the church. To whom be the glory forever is how he finishes his introductory remarks of this letter. God is, of course, praised by faithfulness. Amen. Let it be is what that means. It puts the exclamation point 
on that introductory statement of this first chapter. Let it be. Now, <clears throat> when we're reading God's Word, we oftentimes can get lost um, in the weeds. We, we, we focus on specifics of why the book was written at that time, what the, writ, uh, what the subject matter was about at that time, uh, what was going on with the people that it was written to at that time. And we might lose some um, uh, context of, well, but what, what's it have to do with me in my life? You know, today, um, we are not at all troubled by any controversy that I'm aware of, and if somebody knows something different, you can correct me, but I don't think we're troubled that much about the issue of circumcision today. Doesn't really come up too often. Haven't heard a preacher talk about circumcision in a long time. Or anybody else on the, uh, with the TV evangelists, you know. Um, so it, it could be easy to say, well, I'm not sure I understand the importance of our reading and rereading and learning about what this letter was saying to the Christians there in Galatia, um, oh, two and a half, three decades after Jesus had died on the cross and, and the day of Pentecost had come to establish the church. There are basic principles of the need to refute false doctrines and to faithfully follow Jesus. Again, we have to remember that God's grace that provides us an opportunity to live forever and ever and ever is so great that we should be willing to not only, when we believe that, we need to be active in our faith and obedient to what makes God happy. We should want to please Him. You know, Tim many times has, uh, in, in sermons, talked about how frustrating it can be and I, th I think Tim is particularly good at not showing this, certainly not publicly when he's talking to somebody, but how frustrating it can be for somebody to pose that question that we've all heard, well, do you think I have to go on Sunday nights back to church, or do I have to be there on Wednesday night? And I, I mean, and I'm not making light of people asking that question because I'm going to tell you something, I've asked that question myself at least internally before. But that should never be the question. <laughs> we should want to be there. Sometimes we ought to have the attitude, why can't we come up there on a Monday night or Tuesday night? Or is there something I could be doing one of these other nights if I've got the wherewithal and the opportunity to be doing something proactively and positively for God? Um, so... The faith that we have should be the kind of faith that wants to make God happy. He has given us, unquestionably, the greatest gift he could ever be given. An opportunity, notwithstanding the fact that we are sinners, we're filthy with sin, we're in rags spiritually, we're bankrupt spiritually, but he's given us an opportunity to be wealthy beyond our imagination. And of course, the, the, God's word does the best job it possibly can in conveying in terms we might be able to relate to of what heaven will be like. But I, in my heart of hearts, believe that it's going to be so much greater, so unimaginably greater than anything we can conjure up in word or thought, that we should want to make God happy. We should go out of our way to be 
to live a life as, as, as close to the example that uh, the Christ set as we possibly can. You know, some today rely on principles of the Old Testament for various doctrines. Jerry lists some Catholic practices of priesthood. I'd throw in Episcopalian practices, Presbyterian practices, using, you know, the, the raiments and robes, uh, burning of incense, structures cathedral-like that are, that are somewhat reminiscent of the temple. Um, we got denominations uh, like the Adventists that uh, say we need to worship on Saturday because of what the old law and the Ten Commandments talked about with the Sabbath day, keeping it holy. Uh, there are many, many uh, denominations um, that uh, defend the use of instruments, mechanical instruments, uh, uh, during worship services. They, they used mechanical instruments to worship God in the Old Testament. We have absolutely no um, examples whatsoever uh, in the New Testament of that. And in fact, uh, to the contrary, Scripture talks about the instruments being our lips uh, to provide praise. We're, we're commanded to sing. Um, but these are just some examples that we need to be cognizant of today. That the, false t the present evil age didn't end at a particular time in chronological history. It, it's been ongoing and will continue to be ongoing. And um, the, the, the issue of um, adulterating God's truth uh, with the fact we need to hold on to, for example, um, being circumcised, the rite of circumcision, was the predominant um, issue of that time in the first century. That's gone away. That's no longer the issue. But there are other issues today, as we've just talked about. There's, there's issues of what God wants us to do based upon what he has told us. God did not uh, leave us to our own devices. He gave us a guide um, in his inspired word as to how he wanted us to worship him, how he wanted us to treat other people, but um, being stiff-necked and stubborn, we choose to um, try to bend or change or um, make those rules uh, through rationalization fit how we want to do things. And uh, that's where we can get in trouble. That doesn't please God. And we always got to keep that in mind. It may please us one way or the other, but what pleases God? That should always be our first consideration in everything we do. We're going to look at um, next week when Jerry returns. Uh, we're going to start in with uh, verse 6 uh, and be looking at uh, uh, chapter 1 and some, some uh, things that we can learn from that. I appreciate your attention. Again, keep uh, Jerry in your prayers. Uh, let's uh, close with a word of prayer. Father God, we thank you for your holy word. We thank you for uh, your spirit that was at work with Paul and others to give us your will, to tell us more about you, to tell us more about how you wanted us to please you, to tell us how you wanted us to treat other people. Father, may we always do our very best to look into your word so that we can know the truth and then try our very best to be obedient to your truth in a way that makes you happy and it gives us the peace that comes with being in a right relationship with you. Father, again, we pray that you'll bless Jerry with a better measure of health, that you'll be with all of the others that are dealing with pain and suffering and be with each one of us today 
so that as we reach out to others, we are a positive reflection of you. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Thank you all.